I've often wondered why turbine blades in rocket engines are not actively cooled. And in this video we will cover the answer. After all, in aircraft engines this concept has been standard since the 1970s. It's one of the reasons why these engines can be reused tens of thousands of times and operate at such high efficiencies, which would be also really advantageous for rocket engines. So why has this never been applied to rocket engines? I decided to make a deep research dive into the topic. And in the process, I found an incredible, innovative US patent, which might fundamentally change how rocket engines are built in the future, and possibly even reshape the future of spaceflight. But more to that later. First, let's take a step back and look at the basics. Why do we even need turbine blade cooling? With turbine blade cooling, higher turbine inlet temperatures are achievable, without metals reaching their melting points. Higher inlet temperature means more expansion energy of the gas and therefore more power. And rocket scientists usually like more power. In this video, we will first look at how active cooling works in aircraft engines, then try to apply the principle to the Saturn V J2 engine rocket turbo pump, and finally look at the incredible patent design in comparison with SpaceX Merlin engine in terms of performance. We will go through its advantages, challenges, and end with a conclusion. So let's start. To understand how turbine blade cooling could work in rocket engines, it makes sense to first look at how it's already done in other engine types, for example in airplane turbofan engines. For this, first let's have a quick look how airplane turbofan engines work. In the picture, the base working principle is displayed. Air enters through the intake and is directed into the compressor where several stages of blades progressively increase its pressure. The compressed air then flows into the combustor, where fuel is injected and mixed with the airflow. The mixture is then ignited and burned. The resulting high energy gases expand through the turbine, which is mechanically linked to the compressor via a common shaft. As the turbine extracts energy from the hot gases and is turned, it drives the compressor upstream. Now that we understand the basic working principle of a turbofan engine, we can have a look at how turbine blade cooling is here implemented at system level. The cooling system is displayed in this picture. As you can see, there are many cooling paths. For blade cooling, the light blue arrows are important. As you can see, the air is not taken into the internal paths at the front of the engine, but rather from the later stages of the compressor where it's already highly compressed and therefore also somewhat heated. At this point, the air's higher pressure and greater mass flow make it far more effective for cooling. Although already hot at around 400 degrees Celsius, it is still much cooler than the combustion gases downstream. This compressed air is routed through internal passages in the shaft toward the turbine section, where it flows through the hollow turbine blades. As it passes through these blades, it absorbs heat from the metal preventing the material from reaching its melting point. The heated cooling air is then released directly into the main gas stream. This is not an issue since it is the same working fluid as the combustion gases and does not cause combustion instability or unwanted reactions. The large volumetric flow and high pressure of the cooling air make it highly effective at carrying away heat, enabling the turbine to operate in gas temperatures far above what the metal could withstand uncooled. Now let's go a level deeper and look at the detailed layout of turbine blades and see how the cooling air flows through them. The images here show several different blade cooling concepts which were developed over the years. In the simplest approach, air is routed through internal passages within the blade and then discharged from the tip. This is known as single pass internal cooling and was developed in the 1960s. Here, the blade gets only cooled through internal regenerative cooling. More advanced designs use both low pressure and high pressure cooling air feeds. These supply air not only through the root but also into multiple channels inside the blade, allowing it to exit through small holes along the surface. This creates a thin protective layer of cooler air, known as film cooling, that shields the blade from the surrounding hot combustion gases. So it's a combination of regenerative cooling and film cooling. This approach was developed also relatively early in the 1970s. Modern blades used today often combine multiple internal flow paths with extensive film cooling, resulting in far greater heat protection than earlier designs could achieve. When you have the concept from turbofan engines laid out, you might think that you could apply it to a turbo pump of a rocket engine, which is in principle a good approach to solving problems. 
understand how in other areas a problem is solved and transfer the solution to your problem. Let's first have a look at a conventional turbo pump. Here you can see a schematic of the Saturn V J2 engine turbo pump. The figure is from an original NASA document which details the complete engine. I made a separate video about the J2 engine and this document. If you are interested, you can check it out in the info box. The pump section is located at the top with the main components colored in blue. The turbine stage is at the bottom with the blade assembly marked in red. Connected are both regions through the gray colored shaft. In turbo pumps, a small fraction of the pump flow is already separated for cooling purposes. For example, to cool the bearings. It is relatively easy to extend this idea and route some of the fluid to the bottom turbine region and transfer fluid through the turbine blades as well, like shown in the animation. But here's the problem. In turbofan engines, the cooling air can simply be discharged into the main gas stream after passing through the blades, because it's the same working fluid. But in rocket turbo pumps, that is not possible. Expelling fuel, such as RP1, directly into the turbine hot gas flow would result in catastrophic combustion and explosion of the whole engine. Therefore, somehow the cooling fluid should be recirculated back into the main flow after passing through the blades. But this is almost impossible, because the centrifugal forces in the rotating turbine stage at around 40,000 rpm are so strong that almost nothing is capable to returning the cooling fluid from the edge of the blades back to the main flow. For this reason, direct transfer of the turbofan cooling principle to rocket turbo pumps does not work with the exception of maybe routing the cooling fluid just through the stationary blades. Now that we have thought through how conventional methods from turbofan engines might be applied and seeing why they would fail in rocket engines, the next question becomes what other solutions could be thought of to have active turbine blade cooling in rocket engines. In the process of thinking and researching about implementing cooling of turbine blades in rocket engines, I stumbled over a US patent, which developed a new kind of turbine pump combination. This idea slash concept might solve the problem of circulating cooling fluid forth and back through turbine blades and make rocket engines way more efficient. This new type of turbo pump is at first sight not that easy to understand. Therefore, I will try to explain it first in this 2D figure with animated flow paths. In the figure, again, the pump components are shown in blue and the turbine components in red. The hot gases from the preburner are introduced into the turbine volute manifold. The turbine blades, which are indicated here by red dotted lines, are mechanically connected to the impeller. As the gas flows across the blades, they extract work and cause the impeller and turbine stage to start spinning together as one unit. Therefore, turbine and pump wrap around one shaft section and are, not like in common turbo pumps, spaced apart on the shaft in two regions. To make the flow path of the gas through the turbine stage clearer, here's a 3D view from the pattern. On the fuel side, for example with RP1, the liquid enters the pump inlet is accelerated and then discharged into the pump volute. On its way, it passes through the hollow turbine blades, which allows the fuel to absorb heat and cool the metal surfaces. Here is again a 3D figure, which makes the flow path of the fuel through the impeller and turbine blades clearer. And when all the flow paths are considered together, the combined diagram provides a complete picture of how this novel turbo pump concept works. This combined turbine and pump stage design avoids the problem with circulating cooling fluid against the centrifugal forces by letting the fluid pass through the turbine blades before introducing them into the volute. The volumetric flow through the pump and therefore through the turbine blades is also very high which makes it well suited for effective cooling. In addition, the short shaft length means that rotor vibration dynamics are largely eliminated and the compact design leads to overall mass savings. But the design has still one problem. At the intersection of turbine and pump, two different highly reactive working fluids come very close to each other. And if they would come in contact, an explosion would occur. As mentioned before, this is not a problem in aircraft engines, where the cooling medium is simply air and gets dumped overboard simultaneously with the exhaust flow. But in a similar way, the problem already exists in conventional turbo pumps, where the rotating shaft must be sealed from the turbine stage. For this purpose, perch seal assemblies are used, in which inert gas is introduced to keep the fluid separated. 
A comparable approach could also be applied in this combined design. But instead of sealing the shaft, one could simply seal the intersection area between pump and turbine. We have now covered how the new type of turbo pump works and have seen that there are really a lot of advantages to the design. However, up to this point, the arguments have been mainly qualitative in nature. So now let's quantify the design and see which performance gains would really be achievable with this design. For this, we first analyze the current performance of turbo pumps with the example of a conventional but state-of-the-art gas generator engine, SpaceX Merlin engine. And then compared to a design where we still take all of the components of the original Merlin engine and swap just the turbo pump out with the new design. As a disclaimer, all values presented here are based on standard equations and typical parameters that are reasonably close to real figures. Nevertheless, these are still estimates. In a conventional gas generator cycle, such as the Merlin engine, the turbine temperature is kept intentionally low. The hot gases are burned fuel rich to reduce the temperature and prevent turbine damage. Temperatures close to 1100 Kelvin are common. This limits efficiency but is necessary to preserve the components. In this original configuration, turbine efficiency reaches up to about 78% and pump efficiency is close to 80%. Taken together, this results in a combined efficiency of roughly 62%. These values are taken from literature and are reasonable. If we instead imagine the Merlin engine equipped with the patent turbo pump, the picture changes. With active cooling, the turbine could tolerate much higher inlet temperatures, estimated around 1600 Kelvin. Considering a cooling flow in the order of 100 kg per second, because the whole RP1 mass flow is used, this value is still conservative. If we do the math, which we will not go into, but here is a small screenshot, a still realistic estimate would be in the order of 2000 Kelvin. But for the moment, we will stick with the conservative value to be really on the safe side. And just as a side note, this value is also well below the theoretical stoichiometric maximum temperature of 3600 Kelvin for kerosene and liquid oxygen. Higher turbine inlet temperature means more expansion energy can be extracted from the hot gases, which directly translates into higher performance. Therefore, the efficiency values change now. With this increase in temperature margin, turbine efficiency could climb to about 84% while the pump might operate at around 85%. Together, this results in an overall efficiency of about 71%. This figure does not yet include several secondary advantages of the design. As mentioned before, fewer mechanical losses from shaft vibrations, smoother rotor dynamics, reduced bearing loads and smaller clearances. An estimate for these advantages was done with conventional turbine slash pump equations, which led to a value of 4% efficiency gain. On top of that, the more compact architecture reduces mass, which could also contribute with a rule of thumb around 2% efficiency gain. Altogether, the upper bound estimate for this design reaches around 77% efficiency. Compared to the 62% of the conventional design, this represents a gain of roughly 15% points, which is a very significant improvement in the context of space propulsion, where every kilogram and efficiency point matters. So let us get back to the starting question. Why are at the time rocket engine blades not actively cooled? The answer is that in traditional designs, it simply does not make sense. The technical complexity of routing liquid coolant through fast rotating turbine blades is enormous. In open cycle gas generator engines, where active cooling would be beneficial, coolant would have to be pumped in and out of the turbine at high flow rates, through joints spinning at tens of thousands of revolutions per minute. And the coolant fluid would have to be back cycled against immense centrifugal forces. This requires significant physical space, adds mass, and creates mechanical challenges. In contrast, in turbofan engines, air can be used and expelled at the tip of the blades into the main exhaust. But in rocket engines, the working fluid is fuel, which cannot simply be expelled in the hot gas stream without causing explosions. Another important point is that in staged combustion engines, such as the Raptor, active blade cooling is not required at all. In these systems, the gas driving the turbine is only partially combusted and therefore intentionally kept at low temperatures, so that it can be fully burned at higher efficiencies later in the main combustion chamber. 
Because of this design choice, the turbine never even has to see extremely hot gases. With the new turbo pump concept, however, the situation could be different for open cycle engines. Because of the integrated flow path through the turbine and pump, a reliable cooling method becomes more feasible. This could provide performance improvements in the order of 15%, as we have estimated earlier. Additionally, since modern rocket engines are increasingly designed for reusability, reducing thermal stress on turbine blades would lower maintenance effort in a way similar to aircraft engines. On the other hand, significant challenges remain. The development costs and technical risks would be high. And sealing between the hot turbine gas and the cold fuel to fluids that must never come in contact would be a critical problem. In summary, we have seen how turbine blade cooling is applied in turbofan engines and why directly transferring that concept to rocket engines is not feasible. Conventional designs face many issues with centrifugal forces, complexity and safety, which is why active cooling has never been adopted. The patented turbo pump concept, however, offers a potential solution by integrating the cooling path directly into the combined turbine pump stage. This could enable much higher turbine inlet temperatures, reduce mechanical losses and deliver efficiency gains of up to 15 percentage points. At the same time, ceiling challenges and development risks remain significant. Whether such a design will become practical in future rocket engines is still uncertain. But the potential benefits are clear. Thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel, leave a like and consider to subscribe. And have a look at the videos in the end card. Maybe one of them interests you too.